my goodness. It's like the powerhouse panel here. <laughs> uh, if they start sniffing, don't read too much into it. <laughs> there was nothing going on backstage yet. So um, anyway, I have uh, a tremendous panel. You probably know Dan Barber. This is his house, and uh, he'll be cooking for us. And uh, thanks for letting us be here. Um, and uh, Kimball Musk. Um, he and his older brother uh, made some really good decisions in the early days of the internet, and uh, uh, they made like a ginormous pile of money. And then he veered smartly, in this humble uh, reporter's opinion, into food. So his taking his big brain and his big pile of money and putting it on food. So we're uh, happy to have you. Also sits on the board of Chipotle, right? Um, SpaceX and uh, uh, Tesla Motors, am I right? Anything else you're doing? Likes long walks on the beach. He's a Virgo. <laughs> I, uh, I thought it's like the dating game here. I like this. Um, and Ellie Truesdale, who um, it is responsible for if for products in 35 Whole Foods. So she's her title is Forager, uh, which is great. But she's basically tastes everything you're gonna buy at Whole Foods that's <laughs> particularly interesting beyond the fruit, the organic Fruit Loops. Um, although maybe you taste those too. <laughs> Occasionally. Occasionally. <laughs> um, she's responsible for finding, seeing, working with producers, seeing if it's going to work in the market. So if there's anybody who has their fingers on the pulse of what um, the Whole Foods buyer wants and what will sell um, and what's out there, it's Ellie. So, uh, Kimball, um, we're going to start with you. This whole idea is to give us an overview of what uh, is happening um, kind of in, a, in the intellectual space in food, what the next trends are, and then how they actually might translate. Um, Kimball, what is the biggest issue right now, you think, for, uh, in the food space for, 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 uh, for people who eat and grow food? Cool. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is, this is really exciting. Um, the, uh, you know, I've been doing a talk now for about a year and a half on the food is the new internet, which is, to your point, I, I, I got lucky, I think, you know, starting my career when, when the internet started. And I see this incredible wave in food today that's similar to the wave of innovation and, and excitement that I saw in the 90s in the internet. But the, the question I get asked every time I'm fit off the stage, they'll say, like, well, why? Why is there this desire for innovation? Or why is this opportunity in front of us? And the consistent theme that I have is, that I've seen is just trust. So trust is the currency of our generation. Um, and if you look at kale, I, which is the title of our talk, uh, it's like the Bernie Sanders of the food industry. <laughs> I mean, we will go to extraordinary lengths for something we just trust. <laughs> so um, I, I think we have a, uh, an incredible opportunity in food, but I really, really believe trust is a theme and why, it's why things are changing so much. All right, um, Dan, what are you seeing? I mean, when we were here last time with you, uh, we had a beautiful uh, dinner uh, made on kitchen waste, essentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you really rode the, uh, I led the charge on changing um, uh, the population's attitude toward food and food waste. And we've, that, people's awareness about food waste changed in a minute because people like you were uh, leading the way. You did that great series I of waste dinners. I think I got dinners. lucky, but I was you gonna got invest in the internet back then, but I was yeah. like. <laughs> but I'm like, look at these carrot peelings. Yeah, I think like, this is the future. I was like, yeah. internet's not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> That'll never happen. Yeah, it never happened. So, but what are you, um, what are you excited about right now and what you're doing? What do you see? Uh, uh, what's well, the new waste, man? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's a deepening of the conversation because you know the, so much of what's talked about when we when we talk about food waste is the the ugly fruits and vegetables and the expired dairy and what you're leaving on your plate, not eating for dinner, and you know that 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 is important. And I think it the problem is it lasts about as long as this conversation, you right. know, and it doesn't. It doesn't bleed into the into the culture and the, for the long game, you know. And, and it, it, you know, the, the issue of food waste really is about is, a, is an agriculture issue, uh, and it's a diet related issue. And and if we start to address how much meat we're eating, the 90 million acres of corn that's that's planted in this country, issues that we we cover, but we don't cover in terms of food waste. We cover in terms of bad agriculture practices or bad health practices. In fact, it's it's quite wasteful to to plant 90 million acres of something that we don't eat. And we don't eat directly. We eat through a little bit, half of it through, through meat. Well, that's incredibly inefficient. That's another way to think about waste. And you know, what, I, what, what we're trying to do is expand that conversation, deepen it to the extent that we can look at, at, at a food system and patterns of eating that soak up waste through pleasure, through deliciousness, instead of through the dictate of you ought to eat that expired dairy because it really shouldn't. 
right. shouldn't be thrown in the garbage. Uh, so, so that's the hope, is that it inculcates into the culture through the chef's craft and through, through the food culture, ultimately. And Ellie, you watch things come from a brain like this, kind of through the cultural sluice box down onto the, the retailer's shelf. So um, if this idea of waste and, and it's like, oh, expired products or ugly vegetables is just kind of the gateway into this larger thinking about food waste and waste um, in terms of how we, you know, how we grow our food. So uh, at the consumer level, is, is how a piece of uh, uh, meat produced mattering to people more? Do you think this is selling? Are, are people interested in this? Yeah, I think it's interesting. We were talking about this before we stepped out here, just that food waste was maybe your initiative two, two years ago, a year ago, and was such a, a big deal and looking towards the next thing. And what's interesting about being part of a, a food retailer is those things take a lot of time to hit the consumer or to even matter to the consumer. And I think right now, we're starting to really introduce some products that are addressing um, problems of food waste or who are taking that into consideration. And I think the thing that's still interesting is that probably for this audience or this group, there's a real um, care and, and a real level of, of study around what they're eating. But for probably the large, vast majority of consumers, they're not um, reading about food in, in this type of way. So you still have to introduce a product that's palatable in the sense of like it's tasty. Um, you have to introduce a product that is simple enough to consume at home. And so there's you have to strike the right balance between really interesting, amazing thought leadership and culinary innovation and then what's actually going to be consumed at home and accessible and um, and something that you can keep in your pantry every day or keep in your fridge. And I think chickpea water, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say Bernie Sanders. Yeah, Bernie Sanders. You <laughs> yeah, keep him in your the, fridge. Like makes up a lot of Sanders. shelf space. You want to yeah. take him home. Um, <laughs> I think, yes, I, I think there are a lot of examples of products more recently that we've introduced. I worked closely with a company called Sir Kensington's, a condiment company, um, in when they discovered that the byproduct of chickpeas called aquafaba could make this amazing vegan mayo. It's a great egg substitute. And in hearing about that, I, I told them they should probably connect with our hummus suppliers because you know they're the perfect source for look at the big brain on you. Okay. So we connected them uh, with a couple different hummus suppliers, and um, they landed on Ithaca Hummus as being this great provider of, of uh, aquafaba. They now buy all of the waste that was going down the drain and make a vegan mayo. It's not solving the world's food waste problems, that's for sure, but it's a really nice step toward um, addressing that issue, and it's a great product. So I think more than anything, even if something is solving an issue or has some level of academic or ideological value, you still have to make sure that it, it tastes great and it's something that the consumer knows what to do with. All right, well, let's take this back to you, Dan, for a minute. We're looking at grains and getting people to change and think differently about grains, and certainly, um, the gluten-free moment has people thinking about wheat. Uh, and I think at the chefs were looking at um, ancient grains and different sorts of uh, uh, grains to fill that need or to maybe at least make us think about what does our wheat supply really look like? What is our, our mass-consumed wheat and what are the problems with it? So tell me a little bit about what you see in terms of the grain world. And then I want to go back to you and talk a little bit about this because the stuff in terms of certain kinds of breads and grains that excites us yeah. The question is, can we sell that? So what do you, what is, what's your favorite grain right now? Yeah. This is personal. We like to get yeah, in there. No, I, I don't yeah. pick favorites. I mean, I, what I like is a region that deals with growing grains as a system, uh, an ecological system, so that if you're, if you're interested in wheat uh, culturally, historically, you know, historically, or because the region grows terrific wheat, I'm, I'm as interested in that wheat as I am everything else that makes that wheat taste good. So that's, that's a rotation of barley and buckwheat, and that's a rotation of cover crops, and that's a rotation of leguminous crops. And how do we incorporate all of those crops into our everyday eating patterns so that we not only enjoy the wheat, but enjoy the nose to tail of the whole farm and not just uh, uh, the monoculture of wheat. And that, that to me, that's the more, yeah, it's a more exciting way to eat. It's also the future of good food uh, because it's responsive to what the ecological conditions are dictating in the, in the same way that you know, uh, Japan is a rice culture, but in order to grow the rice, historically, you had buckwheat as a rotation crop into, into rice. Well, in this country, a farmer grows buckwheat. Most of it is either going into dog food or being plowed into the ground or being fed to pigs. In Japan, what do you do with the buckwheat? You make soba noodles. You know, and you inculcate soba noodles 
into the everyday mores and traditions of what it means to be Japanese so that you're not pointing your finger and saying, you have to eat this grain if you want to enjoy your rice. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't last. Uh, in fact, you eat soba noodles because they're delicious and because they become what it means to be Japanese. Uh, in the same way that uh, in South America, you don't eat corn without beans. Uh, in the same way that in Italy, you don't eat wheat, even though we think of it as a pasta culture, you don't eat the wheat without, without the beans as well. Uh, millet in, in North Africa, lentils in India, and on and on. Every culture, every cuisine has built into it this suite of ingredients that allows you to have the king crop, whether it's wheat in the Western civilization, corn in the South, or rice in, in Asian cultures. So for us, it's the uh, so hamburger and the French fries. Yeah, for yeah. us, we don't, we don't, we never, we never were forced into those kind of negotiations because we were so rich. As a country, we were so rich. Agriculturally, we were young. We had soil fertility, we had temperate climates, we had rainfall, and we had this overabundance. So in fact, in many ways, we never had a food culture because we were never forced into one. And part of, part of, the, part of what makes the great cuisines so great and so long lasting is that they were forced into the kind of negotiations that, that produce delicious food out of necessity. Don't you think we're right at the cusp of that though? Of creating our own, uh, you know, we're at the cusp of necessity in a way in this country. And I yeah, think I think we're at a bit of a crossroads here where yeah. we, we're, we've been riding high on the hog a bit long and, and, and it's being driven in part by ecological consideration, but I would say as much it's being driven by just good flavor and chefs and people who care about these issues, good food, uh, are driving diversity, and diversity that's reflected by what the landscape can provide is always the most delicious. I think that's the future of food. All right. And uh, uh, Kimball, um, we, we had, you two had actually had an interesting discussion here a couple weeks ago. You're we got into, into a bit of a fight, is right. what right. you're saying. So, yeah. so you want to bring back up. That's right, that's <laughs> right. I've got, like, it's the debate, the debate thing on my head. Yeah. I'm like, let's. Um, so, uh, uh, Hillary, if we could go to, no. Um, so, <laughs> if we. Um, you tell us about your what vertical. Is that? Your, Trump, it? <laughs> not that there's anything wrong oh, with okay. it. <laughs> it's America, um, right? And I, well, anyway. <laughs> um, so, but tell us about your vertical farming project sure, and absolutely. this notion of raising not only food in urban environments but farmers in urban environments. Yeah. So, so you know, I, my my theme on everything is trust. So, trying to create trust because I really do believe that is what people are striving for. I actually don't agree that we are, we're hitting the limits. We're actually, in the case of corn and soybeans, 40% of our corn is growing eth ethanol, which is just a total waste of land, and that's due, due to government regulations and welfare. We have lots of stuff to do with that land, so I just needed to get that in there. But um, Mark that the, um, the, the, the issue with trust is that you want to get the food, you want, you want things as transparent as possible. And uh, what Rodney was saying, for, from uh, Kroger was saying earlier, transparency is what gives people trust. And we do that with our restaurants, very local, transparent supply chain at different price points. We work with schools teaching kids about food at massive scale. Uh, and the scale is where the trust comes in, so we can do 100 schools at a time. And what was missing the whole time was the fact that we would get one young person after another coming up to us and saying, I really want to work in food. What should I do? And you know, we would send them off to some interesting company, Whole Foods or Chipotle or some, some interesting companies. But they really were entrepreneurs, and they, and they wanted something to do. And um, I came across this technology uh, using vertical farming in Boston called Freight Farms that puts vertical farms in storage containers. And the important thing there is that it's super safe. Um, the technology today is pretty good. It's not as good as it'll be in a few years. Uh, we want the flavor to be uh, competitive, and it is getting there. You know, I, I, with enough electricity, you can, you can make a strawberry taste uh, literally, as a chef, you can literally design it to be, I would like a certain amount of sweetness and tartness and vitamin C and color using light recipes, no, no artificial ingredients at all. So it's really powerful technology that's coming down the pipe. And it's put into these storage containers that one kid can, ha can, can manage for 20 hours a week, possibly, probably during college. And so uh, I love the idea, and I did something similar when I was in university, just a business on the side while you were in college. So we're starting with 10 of them. We're, it's a 10 farm campus in Brooklyn. And the idea there on the trust side is to bring food as close to the consumer as possible. So that the consumer will literally know exactly where that food was grown, who grew it, and the food will be delivered uh, by that person. So it's a, it's a direct consumer model, mostly to teach these kids how to be entrepreneurs and understand about food. And uh, in the, you know, on the way, we'll build, a, we hope, a, a very exciting food brand. Um, but uh, primarily, if we can get these kids graduated as real food entrepreneurs ready to take on the world, even if they start the next Google, 
they will do it with a really good understanding of what food really is. So we're growing food in shipping containers with uh, lights to customize taste as a, 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 a training young farmers in, and having transparency. But does that, do you it's think you need earth? It's not making me hungry It's not making you hungry. <laughs> so do, what, you, you're taking the earth out of this equation. Yeah, this right, you're like taking soil idea. out of it. Uh, to be fair, I, you know, when we had our argument, I wasn't arguing, <laughs> discussion, it was a room full of, of multi-millionaires who were looking to invest in food system change. I see. And Kimball is so articulate. I want to give him money right now. <laughs> I don't even have any. So that, no. that was yeah. what I was reacting to. I was like, give right. me the money. Yeah. Because I, you know. So what, what, I, what, I, what I said, I saw this big swoosh of money going in his direction. Yeah, you're like, you got to change, yeah. change that tide, brother. Yeah. Don't know what I said. I just don't know enough about vertical farming to come down so strongly. But, I, but from what I understand, I'd, I'd rather invest intellectual capital, uh, training, passion into the soil that exists just outside our windows right here and in the Hudson Valley, for example. Uh, because those systems are there, those farmers are there. And what I said to the audience uh, of these millionaires uh, was that we, we have a deficiency describing the, the, um, the forward thinking biological sphere you know we we do very well describing and getting excited about technological innovation and things that you can see like a 20-story vertical farm we have much more difficulty describing what's happening below the soil uh, and that's a deficiency that i think we we need to change and and writers like you and chefs like me need to do better work in getting the next generation excited about the biological world and describing it in a way that that is technologically advanced and futuristic, because it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of complexity, that kind of biological complexity, again, ecological complexity, uh, is, is where the future is for really delicious food. So I, I'm, I'm excited by, by any technology, but when, when Kimball says you, know, you can dial in the flavor and the colors that you want, well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I want that kind of power, and I don't know that uh, I wouldn't be more excited to have a region or on a particular environment express color and flavor and then I work with it in my kitchen. I'm more excited about that. I mean, we're already doing that with hybridization, the blue otter, these things that we create because we think they're more delicious. So there's a little bit of that going on, but always I mean, has one been of, a little bit. One of the yeah. things though that there is common ground is the economics of, of these mass monoculture farms is terrible. I mean, if you grow corn and soybeans, you're basically on government welfare, even if you have 10,000 acres. But I don't think that's what he's talking no, about. No, no, but he's actually talking about farms that are 100 acres in this area. They make more money, probably 10 times the amount of money that a 10,000 acre farmer makes if they do corn and soybeans in today's world. Mm -hmm. so, so I actually think there's a huge opportunity for farmers to go in, take over that, those corn and soybean, create products that actually taste good, that, grow, that are meant to grow in that soil, mm -hmm. and uh, sell it to local restaurants and local grocery stores uh, like Whole Foods and Kroger and otherwise. Huge opportunity, and the problem is you just don't have enough young people with energy to do that. The people that own those lands are 75 years, 80 years. I know that the average age is 58, but actually 55% of, of the farmers in Iowa are 75 years or older. Yeah. They're, not gonna, they're not going to innovate. Um, there will be a lot of change of hands of that land over, over in the next few years, so there's an opportunity there, but their kids don't want it either. So I think the, the challenge is is how do you get them to understand that there is a huge economic opportunity to, do, to farm 100 acres of great tomatoes or great corn, but real corn that you actually eat. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think there's actually, um, from an economic lens, an amazing opportunity in, in, in local farming. See, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I overheard a conversation in Iowa not that long ago that, that I'd be more excited to invest in. The conversation was in Des Moines in this, in this uh, uh, you could have been in Williamsburg in this little food, corner food shop. And there were two guys sitting discussing their plans for the future. One of them is a baker, and he had convinced a corn farmer to take a piece of his land, rotate the crops, and he was going to buy not just the wheat, but the buckwheat and rye and the other crops and make that wheat taste so good and do, be able to do it organically. And next to him was an aspiring beer master maker. And this beer guy said, you know, I'm going to help you in this adventure because I want to be making beer. I'm going to be buying the rye and the barley for the beer. And I'm going to, you know, and then the, the baker said, well, how about I buy from you your mash, your leftover mash with the beer making process, and I make beer with the leftover mash. 
And then the beer guy said, well, I'm going to take all of your stale bread and make a beer out of your stale bread. And right, th see, that's where I'd rather the investment go, into that kind of synergy that, by the way, is directly related to waste, but it's also related to the future of good, good agriculture. Mm -hmm. And that's if you keep the, the system local. That's how you yeah. get that, those sort of those human innovations that happen at the local level. Um, we're going to go to questions in a minute, but Ali, let's go to you for a minute. So sure. all of this is great to talk about. Um, would a dialed in strawberry that you could make taste a certain way, would people want to buy that or would you have to not tell them that that's what they were buying? Like, what's your... <laughs> it totally depends on the consumer. I think one would buy it for that exact reason out of the experimentation and out of the discovery and then some people you'd want to almost trick them or hide that information from them. Um, it is interesting to hear this whole conversation just because I think, you know, we buy from plenty of very traditional soil grown farmers and growers across the country, you know, the majority, and then we also take risks and love to work with hydroponic, aquaponic, verticulture systems as well. And I think it's, I hope that both will continue to, to grow. I, I think, you know, I side a little bit more with Dan and, and just feel that there's, um, there's such history there. There are these systems that um, could probably be adjusted to go back to these supplier relationships that really, um, balance each other and support each other rather than just focusing on one system because still this is one system, a monoculture just done differently that requires a lot of financing to start those. So I think, I think finding the right balance is important and that's really, I mean, that's where a retailer can be involved. That's where you, where you're purchasing, if you're not able to purchase directly from a grower, um, if you're looking for an outlet to buy these products, then it's a matter of hopefully getting that information to the customer that they trust that they understand that's transparent um, and leaving it up to them to decide. You know, I, we did mention I've, I've never had a piece of produce from a hydroponic grower that tastes as delicious to me as a soil grown piece of arugula or, or um, you know, herb or whatnot. And I think that that's something that's being pushed, but I see that in all categories of food. I mean, right now we're seeing all these veggie burgers coming out that are really incredi incredible. They're mimicking beef in texture and flavor in like all of these ways, the Impossible Foods yeah. burger and the Beyond burger, and they're, they're really impressive and they're getting there, so I think that Kim will mention the technology. I think that's the interesting, it's like it's, what we have is a different situation to soil, which we, we, in the rest, we're, we have restaurants and we buy 99.99% .99 of our product from soil grown food, so we, we, we believe the same thing, um, but because it's a technology, you could actually taste the, the indoor farming tech, uh, indoor farmed arugula is a great is a great example. Two years ago, just didn't have much there, and in 2016, you're starting to go, okay, I can work with this. Yeah. You know, it's not quite. It's changing. It's happening. It's not quite as good, but but give us yeah. give us a year, give us two years, and right. um, and then of course right. put it in the hands of young entrepreneurs that really care. Right. And I think you start you start having some fun there. Um, just before we go to questions, anything else you're really seeing on the on the landscape here that we should take note of coming down the, the pike? Um, something that came up in listening to the earlier panel is just in trying to meet um, Americans, consumers, where they are now. And I, I think there really is a, a shift happening mainly around health. And so if we can offer alternatives to what is, you know, I don't think we're going to change snacking culture overnight. I don't think we're going to tell people, eliminate sugar from your diets and, and you know, that we'll still have customers, as was mentioned um, earlier. So I think finding healthful, appropriate alternatives that are cutting down ingredients that are, um, you know, plant-based and, and using alternatives that are going to still meet people where they are is really important. And that's that's something that I'm seeing more and more, particularly on outside of produce, like on the consumer product Like the black side. bean chip or the... Yeah, the black bean, bean brownie, chip. the, um, you know, the roasted chickpea snacks, those those alternatives and, the, and veggie burgers and all of these things, um, nut milks are, are important, hopefully, given where we are as a eating right. culture. And they're moving mainstream really quickly. So if everybody asked your question quickly and you guys answer quickly, I think we can get a few in. I'm sorry we had such a good conversation. So we'll go here and then you in the back there. Yeah. Um, a question, y'all talk a lot about local and I looked up the population of New York State in 2014 with roughly 20 million people. So how many acres of land would it take to create an economic food supply for that mass of people on a local basis? I don't know, carrier one, <laughs> do your... <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. um, I think the, the answer is that uh, there, there, will, there will always be some commodity crops we'll get from around the world. You, 
going to Iowa, we may end up growing, growing some, some corn and soybeans for, forever, frankly, and we'll use them, we'll add them to the feed, to the food supply in New York. I, I think that's a, that's, that's a problem that is uh, maybe easier to solve at a global level than at a state level, because I don't know that math. But at, at a global level, we're, we're producing about 20% more calories than we actually need. Um, so with, now we, of course, put those calories into beef, which reduces the conversion, so we, we lose a lot there. So we have to we have a bit more of a plan for a diet if we want to grow the same amount of produce. We have to get distribution better. Uh, people in parts of the world are starving, and some people are obese. Uh, we have to stop uh, feeding uh, our, our, our lower-income folks um, high-fat, uh, uh, high-salt food that just encourages malnourishment and obesity. So there's, there's at a global scale, the math is a little easier. But, um, I mean, your at, point's well taken, though, know. that, you know, we can't all be having our, all our food coming from 100 acres in our next one thing. So I, I appreciate your point. Yeah, we had a question back here. I, oh, sorry. Can you yell? Uh, we were talking about food waste a little bit. And my question, it's not the sexiest part of food waste, but the vast majority of waste we see as a manufacturer is actually from really poor forecasting from retailers, distributors, and manufacturers and the communication along that continuum. So my question was, Ellie, is Whole Foods doing anything to really make sure that they minimize for uh, minimize waste by better forecasting? Gimbal, is, are there any technological solutions you've seen to this massive challenge? So you're saying she says, ship me X number of whatever. They don't sell it, and it goes to waste. So you're saying if they can forecast the consumer market better, there'll be less waste on, on your end? Am and I understanding that's that That's exactly right? right. OK, Ellie, quick. Yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a very specific supplier question. I know Shane, um, he's sticking it to me. Yeah, it's, Thank it's, you, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting. That is, it's, it's very difficult to take um, the number of stores that we work with, the number of people who walk through our stores and forecast appropriately. But all of our systems and how much we're putting into technology right now is really meant to address that. We're um, converting our stores to a, a standard operating procedure that has limited the amount of back stock and shelf space that we require in our stores by 30%. It's being piloted right now. Um, and I think all of those things are meant to, I mean, increase efficiencies, but also to reduce waste on that end. Um, and of course, this is not the best solution, but we, I mean, every store works with food pantries and food rescue services. So it's not ultimately going to waste, but at the same time, we want to tighten all of those systems. Right. One last quick question. Yes. Arlen. Hi. Quick question for Ellie. Um, in the last panel, we heard that Kroger's fresh and ready prepared foods isn't as profitable as much of the other things they do. Um, I wonder where you think uh, fresh and ready meals are going in grocery retail and what role local or unique ingredients will play in the prepared meal side. Hmm. Very good question. Um, I think I think it's so tricky. So often what I'm, I'm putting out into our stores is never going to be the biggest next thing. Um, so often it's, it's a risk and some of them really, really succeed and some um, are there as an experience as added value and to attract and excite customers to come into our stores. So I think there's a real value in terms of drawing people in. I don't know if it's going to completely move the needle. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard to say. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, I'm, I hope you all can grab them at coffee break. I appreciate it. We're out of time. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.